Well, good morning, Bayshore family. Hey, nothing says Happy Mother's Day like a video of kids saying to their mom, hey, mom, look how awesome we turned out. And maybe you're a mom and those are your kids in that video. And you're like, man, that's true. My kids, they did turn out awesome. Maybe you're a mom watching this and those kids were your kids in the video. And you're like, my kid just lied in church because they did not turn out. I'm just kidding. Every kid in that video turned out awesome. But hey, I love Mother's Day. It's one of my favorite Sundays of the year. And I, I think that we should celebrate moms every day and not just on Mother's Day. Can I get some amens in some living rooms right now? And if you didn't just say amen right then and you're watching this with like maybe your mom or maybe your baby's mama is in the room, you just blew it. Like I just set you up for a win and you missed it right there. But we're all about second chances around here. We're about grace. And so let me give you another chance here. I think that we should celebrate moms every day and not just on Mother's Day. Can I guess some amens out there somewhere? Oh, I can hear it all the way in Gumbor. I heard it. Uh, I love it. And so if you're just joining us, uh, we've been in a series called I Need a Miracle. And we're not done with that series. We're just going to kind of take a little halftime on that. Next weekend, be back. Be back. My dad is going to do I Need a Miracle Part 4. It's going to be amazing. But we got to stop and celebrate the moms today. And I don't want to ignore the fact that this is a really hard day for some of you watching this right now. Maybe, maybe you lost your mom or maybe you're not a mom. And so today, today, we're going to celebrate all the ladies because ladies, you make our lives so much better. You make our families so much better. You make our church so much better. And so whether you got 17 kids and a minivan or you got no kids and a nice car, because you can afford a nice car if you don't got kids. Hello. Um, even if you're a cat mom, listen, I am not here to judge. We are going to celebrate you. And so uh, this is what I want you to do, ladies. I want you to stay seated. But if you're a man and you're watching this and there is a lady in the room, I want you to stand up right now. You got to do it, all right, because then it's going to be embarrassing if you didn't do it. Okay, you got to stand up. Go ahead and stand up. And I want you to cheer for these ladies, okay? Go ahead and cheer for them. And, and ladies, if there's not a man in the room cheering for you right now because there's no one with you, this is me standing up, and I am cheering for you. So come on, man. Let's cheer for these ladies right now. Woo! Come on. You can do better than that. I watch football with some of you. Keep on cheering. These ladies put up with us. Listen, ladies, you deserve flowers. You deserve to have the minivan clean today. You deserve to watch all the HGTV you want today. I took that a little too far. Cotter, I take it a little too far. A little too far. All right, I'll reel it back a little bit. But ladies, we're here to celebrate you today. Man, you can, you can sit back in your lazy boy chairs. So here's the deal. We, we call today's message Girl Boss. And I'll be honest. I didn't even know what that term meant. All right, so this, this term, girl boss, it's a, it's a millennial term. And, um, and so I'm a, I am a millennial, barely. I think I snuck in by like 30 minutes, but I am a millennial. But I did not know what that term meant. And so if you're my age or if you're older, uh, I'm going to help you out here. According to the internet, a girl boss, and we'll put this on a screen, is a woman who knows her worth, gets stuff done, and is an influencer. In other words, it's a lady who kicks butt, doesn't take no for an answer, and doesn't wreck her nails in the process, okay? That's what a girl boss is. So I'm going to kind of help you with who some girl bosses are, because there's some famous girl bosses, just kind of get you to understand this term. And I got some pictures for you. And we got to start out with maybe the most famous girl boss, and that is, of course, Oprah. <laughs> Listen, when you own your own network, and your own magazine, and you are famous for saying, you get a free car, and you get a free car, and you get a free car. Everybody gets a free car. Listen, you are a girl boss. Oprah, man. Um, here's another girl boss that you might not know of. Um, this next one is Sarah Blakely. And Sarah Blakely founded Spanx. Now, every woman who's watching this is like, oh, yeah, Spanx. Every man is like, Spanx. That sounds inappropriate for church. Okay, listen, stop it. Spanx 
is a spandex clothing line, okay? And, and I don't know much about Spanx, but apparently a lot of you all ladies wear it because Sarah Blakely is worth over a billion dollars. That's a whole lot of spandex. Now, men, there are Spanx for men. I'm just putting it out there. No judgment, all right? Now, I, lo- I know I lost all the men on that last one, so I'm going to kind of bring you back with this next girl boss. Um, this next girl boss is Captain Phasma. Now, listen, I would not mess with Captain Phasma from Star Wars, you guys. Listen, and I don't care if she is rocking some Spanx underneath her Stormtrooper costume. She is tall. She's got a sword. That's the most silver shined up Stormtrooper costume I've ever seen. And so Captain Phasma, she's a girl boss. Uh, here, here's another girl boss that's cost me a lot of money, Joanna Gaines, all right, from Fixer Upper. Listen, every man knows. Th- this is why your boo wants to shiplap the entire house, shiplap the car, shiplap your shed, okay? It's all Joanna Gaines' fault. Listen, my wife is so into Joanna Gaines. This is true. She sends her messages on Facebook, just like, hey, Joanna, it's Stacy from Sussex County. That's not weird at all, right? Um, and listen, Joanna Gaines has never written my wife back, but she's never blocked Stacy either. So I think that's kind of a win right there. Um, but speaking of my wife, all right, guys, my wife is the greatest girl boss in the world. Uh, my wife, Stacy, she's a registered nurse and it's been nurses week. And so let's just give it up for all the nurses in the comments right now. Nurses, you all are amazing. And, and my wife has been on the front lines of COVID-19 doing the screenings. And so I have a picture of my wife right here. Listen, when you have to dress like Captain Phasma just to go to work, you are a girl boss. And so my wife, listen, she works all day. And then she comes home and she takes care of me. She takes care of her little dog. She takes care of my, my two kids. She is a girl boss. And she has given birth to over 14 pounds worth of children and has drank ginger ale 15 minutes afterwards. And there is not a man watching this right now that, says they, that can say that they have done that. And so, baby, you are a girl boss. Happy Mother's Day. You are the absolute best. And all these people that we just put on the screen, they're girl bosses because they know their worth, they get stuff done, and they're influencers. Now, speaking of influencers, um, I want to show you a picture of the most influential person in my life. And so let's, let's throw this picture on the screen. This is my mom. And uh, along with my wife, my mom is the greatest mom in the entire world. Now, my mom, she still tries to take care of me, even though I'm, I'm 37 years old, okay? And some of you know all about this. Like, like, for instance, a while back, I had a surgery. And the moment I walked in my, my house after the surgery, my mom, she busts through the front door. She's got two entire rotisserie chickens. She's got a pan of macaroni and cheese, a salad, two pies. And I'm like, mom, did you just rob food line or something? Like, I can't eat all that. I just had surgery. And she's like, you need to eat, son. I was like, yes, ma'am. Because my mom, she always takes care of me. And every time before I preach, including this morning, she tells me before I preach, Joel, I believe in you. And so she's, she's always tuned in to, you know, being like sensitive and, you know, just building me up. Um, but my mom is tough too. Like for instance, my mom had um, complete knee replacement surgery last year. And after she had that done, two months after she had that done, I was in the gym you know, get, get my, my gym on, get, getting swole. Listen, these muscles don't look 3D on your TV without some work, okay? So I was in the, I'm just kidding about that. Anyway, but I was like working out in the gym and um, my mom came in for her first workout after her total knee replacement surgery. And I was, I was on this machine and I looked over and my mom was on a machine and she's like waving at me. And I'm thinking like she just wants to talk to me or something. And so I'm like, you know, mom, I'll, you know, I'll be there in a minute. I just kind of gave her like one of those things. And then I, you know, I just went back to the machine and, and I, I look back like a minute later and my mom was like doing one of these. And I'm like, mom, it's a little embarrassing. Like we're, you know, in public here. Like I'll be there in a minute. And so I finished what I was doing. This is a true story. I go over to my mom and she's like doing one of these. I'm like, mom, what's up? Like, what do we need to talk about? And she's like, honey, my, my, my knee that I got replaced with surgery on, it's stuck in this machine and I'm holding up these weights and I can't stop holding the weights. I need you to help get me out of this. 
And I'm like, oh my goodness, I had no idea. And I like helped her get her out of it. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. And she's like, honey, it's okay. I'm like, she, she just was holding up weights on her knee that she had total knee replacement surgery on two months before. And then she held it for like minutes and she didn't even complain. Look, every man watching this, you would have been like, call 911, call the ambulance, call Oprah or something. But my mom was like, it's okay. My mom, she's, she's a girl boss. And she's been one of the most influential people in my life. And so today, what we're going to do is, is I'm just going to tell you a bunch of stories. And I'm going to tell you four lessons that my girl boss mom taught me growing up. And so four different things my, my mom, four lessons she, she taught me. And so what I love about today is today is for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're a mom. It doesn't matter if you're a dad. It doesn't matter if you're a, a, you know, a cat mom or a Steelers fan. Like today is really for everybody. And so let's, let's kind of jump in and we'll put each one of these on the screen. And so the first lesson that my girl boss mom taught me is do the right thing, not the easy thing. Do the right thing, not the easy thing. So for the first five years of my life, I literally grew up in a trailer in this church's parking lot. Like literally a hundred feet that way is the trailer or, or the, the place where I grew up in a single wide trailer. Now, I've said that a million times in different classes that we've had here, but I found a picture this week of, um, of that trailer in our church. And so let's throw that on the screen. Now, look at this. This is, this is our church back in the day. Now, I think this is like 1985-ish. Um, but let me just kind of point out a few things going on here. First off, we have this garage right here. Now, this is the only thing in this picture that is still standing today. And here's what I remember about this garage. One day, my brother, he snuck into this garage and he drank gas. True story. And the reason we know he drank gas is because he came into the trailer and he's like, Mom, I drank gas. <laughs> and, and if you've ever met my brother or you meet my brother and you're wondering like, what's, what's wrong with him? He drank gasoline as a kid. That's what's wrong with him, okay? So I remember that happening in, in this garage right here. Next, look at this. Look at this van right here. This is like a 15-passenger church van because in the 80s, you were not a legit church unless you were rocking a 15-passenger Ford Econoline van. And we had our van right here. And here's what I remember about this van. My dad, your lead pastor, he used to take the back seats out of this van and he would have me and my brother get in the back of the van and stand up. And then he would drive down the road, swerving the van, and the first person who fell lost. <laughs> True story, okay? And so, like, if you were driving down the back roads of Gumboro in the 80s and you saw a church van, like, swerving all over the road, <laughs> that was us, all right? That was our lead pastor right there. Um, and so we loved the, the church van. Um, then here's the trailer that I grew up in, literally right next to the church. Me and my brother's bedroom was right here. My parents' bedroom was here. And on their end of the house, they had this giant full-size window. And me and my brother, when we were like four and five years old, we would get in our underwear and we would stand in this window and we would wave to cars on Route 30. True story. And people would call my mom who go, would go to the church and they would be like, hey, you know, your kids are standing in the window just waving in their underwear again. <laughs> Completely true. Consequently, our church didn't grow much in the 80s. Then the last thing is this is our church. Now, if you think you went to church a lot as a kid, imagine growing up this close to the church. I always tell people I grew up with a drug problem because I was drugged to church on Sunday morning. I was drugged to church on Sunday night. Then we had Monday night prayer. Tuesday was a deacon's meeting. Wednesday was like, you know, Royal Rangers. Like we were drugged to church, me and my brother, all the time. And my dad was our lead pastor. He was also, at that time, the worship leader. He was also the church van driver. Hello. Um, so he did all these things. So he was busy. And so my mom was the one who would get us to church. And she was the one who would always take us to church. Now, me and my brother, we, we're kind of difficult kids because when, when we would go to church, we thought we owned the place because we literally lived right next door. We were there all the time. And so like, I remember one time uh, I told my Sunday school teacher, sweet Miss Connie, uh, I told her, I was like, listen, Miss Connie, I don't, I don't need to listen to what you're saying because my dad's the president of this place. 
And so Miss Connie, and she still comes to the church. That's a miracle right there. But we were difficult. And my mom, it would have been so much easier if my mom had just skipped church and skipped bringing us to church. It'd be so much easier for my mom to just like put on a VHS in our trailer and just skip taking us to church. But my mom, even though we said embarrassing things to the Sunday school teachers, even though we ran around this place like crazy, she always made sure that we came to church. And, and we hated it sometimes. But today, I love the church. And I can trace my love for this church. I can trace my love for the church back to this picture and my mom saying, hey, it may be hard, but we are going to do the hard thing and we are going to go to church because it's the right thing to do. Listen, my mom taught me that you don't do the easy thing, you do the right thing. And maybe right now you are like facing a hard thing in your life and, and you know what the right thing to do is, which by the way, isn't it true that knowing what's right and doing what's right are two totally different things? Like if, if I'm driving down Route 24 and you like, you cut me off in your 15 passenger Ford Econoline church van, okay, you cut me off. Listen, I know what the right thing to do is, but my Honda Civic starts to like whisper to me, you know, like, you know, just, just press the horn, Joel. Just a little bit like, you're, you're not really a pastor technically while you're driving, right? Like you, you've ever like known what's right, but you just want to do something a little different. Listen, knowing what's right and doing what's right are two totally different things. And so what do we do? Well, here's what a guy named Paul said in um, Philippians 3, verse 12. And we'll, we'll throw it on the screen so you can follow along. Paul says this. He says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But he says, I press on. I press on to possess that perfection. Or, or you could say, I press on to do the right thing for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. And I love that verse because I just want to use this to remind somebody who you know, you're facing something that's hard and you know what the right thing to do is. And you're like, I know what's right, but I, I don't know if I can do what's right. And I just want to encourage you today to press on. Do the right thing. Push through that. And, and, and if you do the easy thing that might be like, give you like some gratification in the moment, listen, down the road, it's not going to be the right thing. So press on, push, do the hard thing. And most of life's biggest decisions, we don't always have the support of the crowd, but we can press on. We can push on. Now, why will we do that? Because the Bible, plus my mom, taught me that you do the right thing, not the easy thing. That's the first lesson that my girl boss mom taught me. Here's the second lesson I feel like my girl boss mom taught me. And it's this, that you invest in what you love. You invest in what you love. Now, I need everybody to participate on this. If you are old enough that you went to college, and if you went to college, I need you to get out of your phones right now. And I need you to leave a comment and just let us know where you went to college, okay? This is your moment to just like put out where you went to college, let us know. And maybe you've waited your whole life for the pastor to say, get on your phones in church. <laughs> I got you. This is your moment right now. I need everybody just, just let us know what college you went to. And while you're doing that, I'll, I'll just kind of tell you where I went to college and, and tell you that I beat you, I think. And the reason I say I beat you is because I went to three different colleges to get my undergrad degree. I, got, I went for like a three for one deal. I went to University of Delaware, Wilmington University and Dell Tech to get my undergrad degree, all right? Like I went to every college in Delaware and I'll never forget my first semester. Uh, my very first semester, I signed up for Biology 101 and my science teacher was Dr. Curtis. And Dr. Curtis loved science. And I thought Dr. Curtis loved me because the very first day of class, he's like, hey guys, for your tests in this class, you can bring an index card and you can write anything you want on that index card just to kind of like jog your memory to help you along with the test and you can bring it and use it during the test. And I thought, whoo, I'm gonna ace the crud out of college. And so I remember my very first test, I got my index card, I filled it all out, it was, I was ready to go. And Dr. Curtis put that test in front of me and there was not one thing that was on my index card that was on that test. Not one thing. And I, I, I can't remember my exact grade, but I got like a 40 or something. Like it was, it was not good. And I was like, I'm going to fail the crud out of college. And, 
And so I, I, went, um, I went outside the classroom after I got my test score and I called my mom on my Nokia cell phone. I'll never forget this. And I said, mom, can I drop out of biology? And she said, you got to call and ask your father first. And I said, come on, mom. And she said, you got to ask your dad. And so I called my dad and my dad was not pumped. All right. But I just reminded him that he used to drive us down the backwards of Gumbro in the van without seats in the back. And then mom didn't know about that yet. But she could know if I told her. And he's like, okay, you can drop the class. Um, so I dropped out of biology. And I tell you that to tell you that I did not get any scholarships to go to college. Okay, listen, when you as a kid stand in your trailer window in your underwear to wave at traffic, you're probably not going to get scholarships. And so I didn't get any scholarships. And my parents paid for me to go to college. Now, I never knew what it cost to go to college until one time my mom had... Um, she was late to send in the check to pay for, for my college tuition that semester. And so before I was leaving home to go to college that day, she handed me a check and she said, on your way to school, can you stop by the college registrar's office and just pay for this semester? I didn't get a chance to send it in the mail. And so I looked at this check and the check was for like $3,000. And I was like, I had no idea that's how much college costs. And, and, and listen, guys, we didn't have any money growing up, all right? My mom drove a 1987 brown Buick where the headliner had detached from the ceiling. And when you put the window down, you had to roll the windows down back in the day, all right? And we would roll the windows down. The headliner would flap in the wind like this as we drove down the road. We didn't have any money, but my mom and my dad were like, we love Joel. And so we are going to invest in him. And that whole concept, you invest in what you love. I, I think I think you get that. Most of us get that concept, except when it comes to where we stand in our relationship with God. Because I, I think for a lot of us, we, we don't think that we're worth very much. A, a lot of us, like, we don't think very highly of ourselves. Now, some of you maybe think too highly of yourselves, all right? That's a whole different story. Most of us, though, we don't think very highly of ourselves. And the reason I know that is because if you talked to other people the way that you talk to you, you wouldn't have very many friends. Well, let, let me say that again. If you talk to other people the way that you talk to you, you wouldn't have very many friends. Like you would never talk to other people the way that you talk to you. Isn't, isn't that true? I'm going to make a pastor confession. That, that's true for me. And, and why do we do that? We do that for two reasons. We either do it because of what we've done or because of what's been done to us. And we think, you know, I, I, I'm not worth anything. Like I'm, I'm like a second class citizen. And so I just want to tell you on this Mother's Day, that may feel true, but that's not true. It is not even close to being true. And the reason I know that is because if it's true that we invest in what we love, and, and I think we know that's true, then keep that in mind. Let me, let me show you a verse, 1 John 3, 16 says this, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up, or you could say Jesus invested his life for us. Listen, we know what real love is because Jesus invested his life for us. And so it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what's been done to you. Jesus gave up his life for you, which places a value on you. And do you know what that value is? Do you know what that, that this verse means? It means you're priceless. And you may, you may feel worthless, but Jesus proved you were priceless when he gave up his life on a cross for you. And so that concept, you invest in what you love. I watched my mom do that in my life, but Jesus has offered you that and has done that for every single one of you watching. And so this Mother's Day, you may feel worthless, but Jesus proved you're priceless because you invest in what you love and he invested in you. Here, here's the third lesson that my girl boss mom taught me. And it is to forgive quickly. Forgive quickly. Now, my mom hates two things. And I primarily mean this about when I was growing up. So let's say my mom hated two things. Number one, um, and this is kind of weird, but my mom hated it <laughs> If we were to touch the walls, the painted walls in our house growing up, listen, 
I could set the backyard on fire, which I did accidentally one time, okay? But that's another story for another day. Um, but I could accidentally set the backyard on fire and get in less trouble than if I were to walk down our hallway at home and let my little index finger touch the side of the wall and touch the paint. Okay, listen, Lord have mercy if you do that. That was the end, all right? Like you didn't have to understand why that was a rule. You just better not do it. My mom hated it if you touched the walls. The second thing that my mom hated growing up was that when me and my brother would fight. And me and my brother fought a lot, all right? Because that's what, you know, brothers do. And, and my brother always beat me up because he's older than me and he's bigger than me. And so like the way I get back at him is I, you know, I tell 2,000 people that he drank gasoline as a kid, all right? Um, so that's just me getting back at my brother. But anyway, we fought a lot. And I'll never forget this. Uh, one day, my mom, when we were kids, she, she drove us to the mall. Come on, 80s, man. She drove us to the mall. And on the way to the mall, she stopped by this, this country store in our brown Buick. And um, before she got out, she looked at my brother and I. And she said, when I go in this store, I want you to stay in the car. But do not fight. And so she got out of the car. And everybody who grew up with a brother knows exactly what we did the moment <laughs> My mom shut that car door. All right, she shut that car door and we were like, oh, it is on in the brown Buick, baby. And we fought so hard in the brown Buick. My mom will verify this. We fogged up all the windows on the inside of the car. Like so much so that we couldn't see out of the windows, which was bad for us because when my mom came back to the car and opened up the door, we didn't know she was coming because the windows were fogged up so bad. And if you fight so bad that you fog up the windows, it is a fight, buddy. And so my mom opens up the car door and my brother has me in like this jujitsu hold. And my mom had a Pentecostal moment. Like she lost it on us. And, and I'll never forget that moment. And, you know, psychologists say that repressed memory is for your own protection. And I don't remember the next six minutes of my life, okay? It was, uh, but I'm pretty sure my mom did not take us to the orange Julius in the mall. Like she was so mad. And I remember we apologized. My brother and I were like, we're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry. And it's the most mad I've ever seen my mom. But after we said we we're sorry, my mom forgave us. She never brought it back up. She, she never held it against us. And I really think that my mom had this down to forgive quickly because as a pattern in her life, she always, and still to this day, forgives quickly. Which reminds me of a conversation that Jesus had with his friend named Peter. And one day they're talking and Peter asks Jesus, he's like, Jesus, like how many times do I gotta forgive somebody? Which, you know, you've had that thought before, all right? Because if you've ever stood in the grocery line in the 12 items or less line and the person in front of you has like 72 items, you're like, Jesus, how many, do I have to for forgive this guy like 72 times? Like how many times, Jesus, do I have to forgive this guy? And so like, We've all wondered that question before. And so here's how this conversation goes. Matthew 18, starting in verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and he asked him this question. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Uh, up, to, up to seven times? Like Peter's like, that's a lot of times. Seven times. That's a whole lot of grace, Jesus. But Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times times. Now, here's what this verse doesn't mean. <laughs> this verse doesn't mean that you get like an index card and when somebody like does something wrong to you, you just like go, that's one. 76 to go, buddy. And oh, there, there's two. <laughs> Jesus says, I only got to forgive you 75 more times and then it is over. Jesus said it is. I don't have to forgive you anymore. Okay, no, 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 no. That's not what this verse means at all. This verse means that we need to be in a constant state of forgiving people. Like we just got to constantly as a pattern forgive people, all right? And the reason I say that, that we need to be in a constant state of forgiveness is because you know it's true that some days you're like, oh, I forgive that person. And the next morning you wake up and you start thinking about them and you start to get angry with them. And so like forgiveness, it's not a one-time event. It's a lifelong process that we just put on repeat. Over and over, a lifelong process, we're like, I'm choosing to forgive that person. I'm choosing to forgive that person. I'm choosing to forgive that person. And maybe you're watching this and you're like, oh, I don't, I don't really have anybody that I'm mad at. Like, I'm not, I'm not holding a grudge against anyone. Listen, I, I thought that too. A couple months ago, I was like, you know, 
thinking in my head, I'm like, Joel, you, you know, you got your stuff together. You're not, you're not holding a grudge against anybody. You know, you're a pastor. You're good. You know, you got it all good. And then I went into the Michael's craft store, <laughs> doing a little craft work. And um, I go in Michael's and I see this person who years before had sat down with me and told me everything they thought I was doing wrong as a pastor. And the moment I saw them, my, my heart rate started going, my blood pressure started raising, I started getting the sweats, you know? And I walked into Michael's thinking, oh, I got it all together. I'm not holding a grudge against anybody. And then I saw them and I thought I wanted to turn them into a craft. Like I wanted to put them on my wall. Like I, and I felt like the Lord was saying to me, listen, see Joel, you need to continue to forgive that person. It's a process. You got to keep forgiving that person. And, and so when you think about your life and if you're thinking like, how do I know, Joel, like if I've forgiven, you know, everybody in my life, this is how you know. If when you think about that person or if you randomly see them, if your blood pressure starts to rise, if your heart starts to beat, and I'm not talking like you want them to be your future boo, okay? I'm not that kind of heart rate starting to beat. I mean, you, your heart rate starts to beat because you get like, whoo, that's the Lord saying, you need to forgive that person. You need to continue to forgive that person. And if you're watching right now and you're holding a grudge against somebody or you're angry with somebody, listen, the longer you hold on to that in life, the more that will rob you of life. You got to keep forgiving. And you might say, well, well Joel, how many times do I got to forgive somebody? Only as many times as Jesus has forgiven you, which is an infinite amount of times. And so um, the reason we got to do that is because Jesus plus my mom taught us to forgive quickly. Now here's my, my, my fourth and final lesson. All right, my fourth and final lesson is this. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Now, um, I've given you three lessons that I've learned from my mom, that, that my mom influenced me on. But this last lesson is actually a lesson that comes from the person who influenced my mom the most in life. And to show you who I'm talking about, we have a picture we'll put on the screen. This is, this is my mom right here back in the day. And um, this is my mom, mom. This is my mom's mom. Now, my mom, mom was a girl boss. All right, my mom, mom she used to um, sit in her breezeway and she would, she would snap green beans. And let me just tell you, my mom, mom could snap more green beans in one sitting than every Sussex County farmer combined, okay? My mom, mom was like pop, pop, pop. She was like Captain Phasma with, with the green beans. She was amazing snapping green beans. She was a girl boss. My mom, mom was also a girl boss because she drove a banana yellow Cadillac. True story. And the leather seats in the banana yellow Cadillac were banana yellow, now, you couldn't see her seats because she put rugs on top of them, blankets on top of them, towels on top, plastic things. Like, this is what grandmas do, buddy. But my mom used to ride around Seaford in her banana yellow Cadillac. And I always loved my mom because my mom introduced me to Mountain Dew. All right, now we weren't allowed to have Mountain Dew in my house growing up. Could you imagine, like, we already stood in the, in the mirror or the window in our underwear, like, waving at traffic without Mountain Dew. Can you imagine if there was Mountain Dew? So my, my parents didn't give me Mountain Dew, but I'd go to my mom's on Saturday, and she would pour me Mountain Dew, and she would let me watch the A-Team on her TV. Listen, if that's not a girl boss, I don't know what is right there. And so I love my mom uh, growing up, and my mom's favorite hymn was It Is Well. That song that we played earlier today. And I, I'll never forget that because about 10 years ago, my mom, uh, my mom was in the nursing home and she had pneumonia at the time. And one night my mom called me and she said, honey, I need you to head to the nursing home because hospice is here and your mom is not doing real well. And we're not sure that she's going to make it through the night. And I remember just, you know, feeling devastated. And I, I remember I hopped in my car. My wife was at work. I hopped in my car. I drove to Seaford. And the whole ride to Seaford, I listened to my mom's favorite song on repeat. I listened to It Is Well With My Soul. And I sang that song and I was so worried that I was going to get to the hospital. My mom wasn't even going to be alive. And so um, I got to the hospital. I, I rushed uh, into, um, this is a nursing home, not the hospital. I rushed into the nursing home. And when I got there, I was surprised because her room was packed. My whole family was there. And when I walked in, my mom was sitting up in the middle of everybody with like the biggest smile on her face. And I went right up to her and I'll never forget when I went to my mom in the nursing home 
The first thing she said to me that night was, Joel, how was your day? I'll, I'll never forget that because my mom was, was sitting on her potential deathbed and she asked me about me. And that night was a night I'll never forget. We, we all sat around, we told stories, we laughed together, you know, we, um, we sang some songs together. At one point, my mom said to us, she's like, guys, I see Jesus in that corner. And we're like, really, my mom? And she's like, yeah. And he's a whole lot smaller than I thought he'd be. <laughs> it was just this funniest thing that my mom said. And, you know, and so it was just this night with all this stuff that I'll never forget. And I, I went home so happy that night. And then the next day, um, my mom called. It was that morning. And, um, and she said, your mom, mom she, she passed away this morning. And I remember her telling me that. And, and for the longest time, I could not figure out, like, how, how was my mom so happy? How did she have so much peace? How, how did she have so much joy just moments before she passed away? And now I feel like I, I, I know the answer. And I feel like the reason my mom, mom had joy and peace while she was moments away from passing away is because it was well with her soul. Like she, she was living out her favorite hymn. You see, my mom um, loved Jesus. She knew she was gonna go be with Jesus. She knew she was going to heaven. She was probably gonna get a gold-plated Cadillac. Like she, she knew where she was going. And she had this peace that Paul talks about. That's the peace that goes beyond our ability to understand. And, and all the amazing character traits that my mom, mom had, she got from the influence of Jesus in her life. And all the amazing things that I saw in my mom, my mom got from the influence of her mom in her life. And, and if I do anything right in life, I can trace it straight back to my mom, who can trace it straight back to her mom, who can trace it straight back to Jesus, who's made it well with all three of our souls. And and one of the things I learned from my mom, mom is how do we have peace with God? We have to make peace with God. That's something that my girl boss, my mom, taught me is that how do you have peace with God? You make peace with God. And that is probably the greatest lesson I've ever learned in life because that lesson changed my life. And so this Mother's Day on Mother's Day 2020, maybe, j just maybe the girl bosses in my life who've influenced me have maybe influenced you to just make that peace with God in your life. So that you can say, like my mom said, it is well with my soul. And, and let me just say, my mom, or my mom was the one who led me to Jesus. And my mom led me to Jesus because of the influence of her mom and her life. And I can just say, look, moms and dads, and, and if you're, you're not a mom or dad, whoever you are, that's been the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. And I can truly say, it is well with my soul. And that is invaluable. And so let me give you that opportunity today. Um, in your living rooms, wherever you're at, would you just bow your heads? And, um, and if you have never uh, made a decision to follow Jesus, I just want you to just, just say this out loud or say this, um, repeat this after me. And let's just say this together. Dear Jesus, I believe that you're the son of God. And I'm choosing to put you at the center of my life today. I believe you died for all my sins and you rose again and came back to life so I could be forgiven. Today, Jesus, I accept you and it is well with my soul. Wow, if you just said that, let me just be the first to congratulate you. That is the best decision you could ever make. And um, if you just said that prayer, um, one thing that you can do to help us is you can text the word Jesus to the number at the bottom of your screen right now. And, you know, we're not going to like show up at your doorstep or, you know, we're not going to show up with a 15 passenger Ford kind of line van. You know, we're not going to do that. We just want to send you a note this week that's just high five you and tell you, hey, that's the best decision you've ever made. Um, for everybody else, happy Mother's Day. Um, and if you're not a mom, listen, happy Ladies' Day. And if you're not a lady, dude, you guys are awesome. You take care of the ladies in your life today. And we're going to end this by throwing it to Cotter and uh, he'll tell you what's next.